All right, Ben today is Thursday. It is May 2nd. Welcome to the Dog Walk presented by Barstool Sports. Uh, so we told you we were going to be doing this. We're going to be mixing in some old school yep. uh, tinfoil Tuesdays. I don't know if this is a tinfoil or not, but um, big, big time tin. It's not even, yeah, I would say it's some tin and it's also, but like there's, this is an older thing, but it just kind of tells you about where things really, really started to go wrong with the CIA. So the CIA, Alan Dulles, and like if you want to talk like deep state and who's really in charge, this is this is a pretty pretty good one to be like, well, this is fucked. Yeah, not good. Not good. And Dulles is always a guy that I've known as like not not good. He Alan Dulles, and it's I'm reading a book right now. It's um it's about Alan Dulles and his brother, and his brother was Secretary of State for um, Eisenhower. And, and Dulles was the head of the CIA. So he kind of had two brothers shaping foreign and domestic policy and answering to really nobody but themselves. And the book I'm reading kind of describes them as they started off as these like Wall Street lawyers. And then they kind of became spies in not kind of they became spies in World War Two. And they never differentiated. They never stopped working for their clients so to speak. So they work for like United Fruit Company, all these like big, big companies that had financial interests, military industrial complex, all that stuff really started with these two brothers and policy and the the formation and the execution of different things by the CIA is shaped by that where it's like, we don't really work for the government or the people. We're working for our clients. Mm -hmm. And that's really came to show on we're talking about gary powers because it's it was we're recording this on may 1st that was m one of the most pivotal moments of the cold war uh may 1st 1960 so that's what we're that's what we're getting after today and he's got an airport right uh the brother does okay uh it's dulles airport in dc is named after the yeah, secretary yeah. of state i would say let's go ahead and rename that one Ooh. i think these are like two of the worst people alan dulles specifically maybe the worst person who ever lived that's a bold claim. I, we just did the female villains draft, and uh, I forget who you drafted, the girl, the adoption woman. Oh, yeah. She's she's bad. But, like, if Evil you- Evil as fuck. Yeah. Well, Georgia Tan. Yeah, it's Georgia Tan. But I think that, I think Alan Dulles is really, in terms of, like, death and destruction post-World War II, and, like, he did things, and maybe we'll do, like, a full one on him someday, where he was, like, the lead spy operating out of Switzerland during World War II. And like he had all kinds of ties to German Nazi led or you know companies through his Wall Street connections. So when FDR was like, "Hey, we want total surrender and denazification of Germany," Alan Dulles was like, "Yeah, yeah," and then would like work with Germans to like get them out, get them to South America, get them into you know Operation Paperclip so they come here, and was like actively working against the orders of the sitting United States president during World War II, and he never stopped doing that. So, and this is another occasion of that. Sounds fucked up. Yeah. And they are renaming airports. Last time I went to Vegas, I was so confused that it's not McCarran anymore. Oh, it's an L. Forget what it's called now, but it's not McCarran anymore. Yeah, just renamed Dulles. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm interested to hear why. Okay. Uh, before we get into it, though, I want to talk about Chevy Drive, Chicago.com. Summer road trip season. It is. It is road trip season. You got to have uh, everything running smooth. So just punch in your zip code. You'll find a Chevy dealership that will take care of you. You, know, you get your tires rotated, your brakes, whatever you need, oil change. Get ready for that road trip. And if you don't have a car to get ready for the road trip, that's the place you want to be too. Yep. The best lineup of SUVs possible is uh, with Chevy. Perfect time. You don't want to be broken down on the side of the road with whatever car you got right now and uh, you know sitting there sweating, waiting for the tow. Uh, sitting in that I-90 traffic, you need ChevyDriveChicago.com to get you right. The SUV lineup in the new Silverado truck has all the space you need to comfortably get to where you're going. Uh, ChevyDriveChicago.com has the latest offers on all vehicles and can help you find your local Chevy dealer. Every Chevy is a number one pick. ChevyDriveChicago.com is the official truck partner of the Chicago Bears. Go to ChevyDriveChicago.com to learn more, and it's really that simple. Just make yeah. sure you're driving Chevy this summer. Mm-hmm. Um, whatever it is, just just check out that fleet and hop on in. I also want to talk to you guys about Stella Blue Coffee because at Stella Blue Coffee, uh, we believe that 
Good coffee is one of life's non-negotiables. Stop drinking those boring, tasteless, big coffee beans and turn to Stella Blue. Remember, your mornings are sacred. It's time you start treating them that way. Not only are Stella Blue coffees premium beans sourced from the most coffee-rich geographies on Earth, but they're also a big cat tasted and approved, which is obviously more important. Stella Blue coffees, delicious roasts, are available in cold brew, K-cups, ground, and whole bean formats to seamlessly fit in your morning coffee routine, and every bag sold helps save dogs. I mean, this is, you just described my morning routine. I get a coffee, I put it in the Chevy, and I get to work. Like, that's that's my routine. So I have a Stella Blue to start every day, hop in the Chevy, and it's, uh, you can't beat it. You could be that way, too. Yeah. Let's get that Chevy Mm -hmm. and head to your local Jewel Osco or Mariano's today to find the very best deals on Stella Blue coffee. Or use promo code WALK for 20% off any order of $25 or more on StellaBlueCoffee.com. Take back your morning with Stella Blue Coffee. All right. I'm interested to hear why this guy is such a POS. Yeah, so we're talking specifically about um, a pilot named Gary Powers, Francis Gary Powers, who is a, uh, he he flew these U-2 planes. So the U-2 plane was like a very secret um, spy plane that the United States used. They had bases where they would take off out of Japan and Pakistan, Turkey, all these other places to do these missions, and they, they had them starting in 1956 and they would do these missions where they would fly over the Soviet Union, Russia, um, to look at their nuclear missile sites, to look at troop movements, uh, uranium, uh, or, you know, nuclear material refining plants that they, you know, were, it was the peak of the cold war. So we're spying on each other left and right. And Gary powers, um, they had a mission for him it, it, the story of like the ordeal that he actually went through is unbelievable. So he was on a, a on an Air Force base in Pakistan, and they were going to have him do the longest mission uh, that a U two has ever done, which was going to take him from Pakistan, you know, through through Russia all the way across, and end up he was going to land in Norway. So a very long mission, and. They've been flying these missions, you know, for for four years. Now it's May 1st, 1960. He takes off. He gets over Russian territory. Now these planes, the reason that they were before this were so effective, is they fly at 70,000 feet. You're at like the upper limits of the atmosphere. The air is really thin. It's a very special type of plane. And it was effective because the Russians had no way to stop it because if you scramble their fighter jets were these variations of what they call the MIG. They would get up to a certain air, a certain altitude and the wings would just like destabilize and kind of like fall apart because they weren't constructed to fly at that altitude. So you kind of had like a free pass into Russian territory. And it was thought that the Russians didn't even have surface to air missiles that could intercept them. So Gary powers is flying over Russian territory 70,000 feet and then all of a sudden uh they you know they scramble migs migs are ineffective but they had radar that they knew he was there so they it's like well there he's up there we can't go get him keeps flying deeper into you know which is the norm flies deeper into russian territory and all of a sudden these surface to air missiles come up the russians had developed uh, a new missile that could go go to 82,000 feet so like he was in range missile doesn't hit him directly but detonates right next to him blows the tail off of his plane at 70,000 feet so now he's like he's in a spin okay at 70,000 like violent spin the nose of the plane is pointing up so he's falling kind of like backwards down towards earth but in like uh, in like a crazy spin the G- and then the wings fall off of the plane because he's the g-force is going so fast as he's spinning around careening down towards earth and the wings fall off. He, the G force is pinning him up against the aircraft. So he can't even really reach to like hit the ejector button or anything like that. And he gets down to about 30,000 feet. He finally is able to free himself. He undoes his seatbelt, his harness hits the ejector thing goes out of the plane. I'm sorry, this happened earlier. That was like 50,000 feet. So now he's flying down. He hits the ejector button. He has his oxygen 
um, it's like an umbilical cord to the aircraft because you're at, you're at so high an altitude, you're almost like an astronaut. So you need oxygen um, directly into your mass to be able to breathe. That system is still connecting. So now he's outside the airplane. The airplane's falling down. He's still attached to the, the body of the airplane, spinning all the time. Finally, at 30,000 feet is when he breaks free of the aircraft. The aircraft goes wherever it goes. Then he starts still in a free fall until his chutes, uh, his parachutes deploy, it, they automatically deploy at 15,000 feet. So now he's like just coasting down. The Russians already knew he was there. They had scrambled the aircraft. So they're like aware of like his general proximity. He lands uh, and is immediately captured. So. The Russians give this you know, big announcement. We have captured, we have shot down an American U.S. spy plane and captured uh, the pilot. And Eisenhower's like, what the fuck? Eisenhower's the president uh, at this time, obviously World War II general, hero, and um, but he's coming to the end of his term. So he goes into the Dulles brothers, and, and Alan Dulles specifically, and he's like, hey, like I had ordered no more spy missions. So uh, Eisenhower, because this is like we said, peak of the Cold War, nuclear arms race, very dangerous, very like uneasy time. They're, you know, they had, China had fallen, gone communist. Cuba had fallen. You had the Korean War earlier. They were at a stalemate, which is still going on today. And so th- the story goes that Eisenhower was like, I, I ordered no more missions because he was he was on what he called a crusade for peace. So this happened on May 1st, 1960. He was supposed to meet with Khrushchev on May 16th in Paris and then Eisenhower was going to tour um, Russia with Khrushchev and they were going to try to work out a disarmament, like we're going to get rid of the nukes, we're going to have a peace agreement and we're going to set up the 20th century to be kind of free of conflict before this turns into a nuclear holocaust because we we have this cold war and it's like very dangerous very uneasy time but eisenhower's like no we're gonna get we're gonna reach an agreement and we're never gonna agree on you know communism or capitalism democracy that's never gonna happen but we can come up with an agreement where we can peacefully coexist so he's he ordered no more missions into russian airspace ahead of my um um you know summit at in paris so He's like, well, what the fuck? Like, I, I said no more of these missions, and now they're saying um, we have a pilot shot down and captured. And they're like, nope, like, no chance. Like, that, that didn't happen. So Eisenhower gets up there, and, and they're like, well, then what was it? So Eisenhower gets up there and, and tells the country and the world that this was a mistake. Uh, we have a NASA plane that, you know, we're – preparing our space program they fly at these high altitudes and they're charting weather and the pilot just got lost it was it was a malfunction of the systems and it was just a a big mistake and then the russians were like no okay they're like because they they hadn't even shown the pilot gary powers so the, the cia was telling hey we didn't have that mission that they t- tell him it's a mistake eisenhower gets up in front of the world says this is this is not true. They don't have him. And then the Russians come back and we're like, he's right fucking here. Like, here he is. So they like broadcast him and then they put him on trial and they convict him of espionage. So they put him in jail. So this is the first time where the American president gets up and is caught in a lie. Might not have been his lie, but he was repeating what he had been told and he had given the orders that, Hey, no ahead of this mission. We're on, on this mission, this crusade for peace. I don't want anything to get fucked up. So no more of these missions. And then what do you know? Things get fucked up. So, like I said, they've been flying these missions before and it's the CIA program, these U2 flights. And they take unbelievable measures to make sure that they always have plausible deniability. So, the pilots of those missions, they never have any identification. There's no American flags, insignia, anything on the plane. The pilot doesn't have anything like that. And so if something goes wrong, you're able to be like, well, I don't know. I don't know who the fuck that guy is, you know? And 
the thinking is if anything does go wrong, if you're at 70,000 feet, the person's going to die. So if they die and you can't question them and they have no identification, no nothing, like that plane theoretically, that could have come from anywhere. So when they were like, hey, like this is a NASA thing and, you know, they don't have that, they don't have Gary Power, they don't have, like, we don't, we don't know anything about it. When they have the living pilot being like, yes, I'm Gary Powers, I'm an Air Force, United States Air Force pilot. Then their whole story goes to shit, and they and they look bad, like egg on their face. So, the, the where the tinfoil part comes in is, did Alan Dulles do this on purpose, more or less, to basically make Eisenhower look bad, get us into trouble, and prevent this peace? Because there's a lot of money in war, and all of his Lockheed Martin, all his clients, they want to be making these jets they want to be making bombs they want to be making all this stuff they want the cold war ramping up they want to go into cuba they want to go into vietnam and laos and you know korea and all these other places and have like these conflicts so their companies can make money off of it so long story short on that whole the whole uh peace conference gets canceled because it's like hey you like the russians like you guys we came to the table and Eisenhower was coming to the table, you know, with good intentions. And it's like, well, you guys are fucking lying. You guys are lying. You said you weren't doing this. You're spying on us right before we're having this conference. You said that this wasn't your pilot. It absolutely was. Okay. So the, another reason why people are like, Alan Dulles did this on purpose, CIA did this on purpose, is because, like I said, when the pilot typically on these missions has no identification. Gary Powers had 19 different forms of identification. He had a specific parachute that was like a, they call it an evade and escape kit where he had like language printed out like, Hey, I am an American. Uh, I'm not going to hurt you. Uh, if you help me, you'll be rewarded. He had his, he had a social security card on him. Okay. With like, like it was like no denying that this guy is who he is. Gary Francis, Gary Powers, he is a United States Air Force pilot. The plane itself had not, they had a term um, called, they would sterilize the plane to make, like like I said, no insignia. The plane had some indicators that it was an American plane. So everything that was normal to keep it clandestine and sterilized and deniable was scrapped for this one mission. Um, and they basically were like trying to throw a wrench in this peace conference for profit of their big military industrial complex customers. And so Gary, Gary powers, he lands and your crash lands and he was getting a lot of criticism because he didn't kill himself. Okay. So he had, there was some reports that he had a cyanide pill. There was no cyanide. He had like this, uh, this pin, this poison pin and it came in a, in like a necklace. And it was like, if you're going to be captured or you're, or, Theoretically, if you're in so much pain from the landing that you should just kill yourself. So you can't be, you can't be questioned. So he didn't do that. So Alan Dulles is probably sitting there being like, we, we, we want to throw a wrench in this, but we also don't want it to fall on us. So they, his understanding is that no one would ever survive a crash from that. Uh, from that altitude, from that one of those planes. And then if it did, there was also a self-destruct button. So you could plot, which would destroy all the film and all the, all the pictures that you're taking at altitude, all these spy pictures that you're taking. But because of the nature of the, the crash and the free fall and the G-force, Gary Powers couldn't flip that switch to do the self-destruct. So then they had all like the, the Russians recovered all the stuff that we were trying to get from them. And the, so like, you're lying. This is not a NASA plane. This is a spy plane. Here are the pictures, some of the pictures that were taken and recovered. So it's like, you guys are full of shit. So then it's like, you know, the, we're like, oh, fuck. Like, like they got our guy. He didn't kill himself. He had all this ID on him. Like, so it, it does feel like the CIA took steps or like ignored their normal process to um, make sure that if he did go down, that it would like kind of cancel this peace conference, which is you're going against the direct orders of the president. And when there was like a congressional hearing about it, Alan Dulles 
you know, because he's like such a sacred cow, like a made man, that he was talking to Al Gore's dad. Al Gore's dad was a senator, I believe, from Tennessee as well. And was like, well, who authorized this? And he goes, ah, well, there's a small group of us. And he's like, I have the authority. He's like, there's a guy from DOD, a guy from CIA, and a guy from the White House. And he goes, well, who were they? He goes, well, ah, can't give you any names. He's like, I don't want to, you know, can't give you any names. He's like, what do you, well, well, did that guy have authority from the president? He goes, I don't know, assume so. Like that, like he assumed that the guy who, whoever this mystery person was, was in contact with the White House, that Eisenhower told him that it was okay to run these missions. When Eisenhower had stated publicly, or not publicly, but stated that there are to be no more missions ahead of the, it was like on April 9th, he said, hey, like we're doing this May 16th, no more spy missions. We're going to try to do this the right way. And then they kind of just went around him and just did whatever they wanted, which was par for the course for the Dulles brothers who are acting on behalf of these American war machines. So he, so they put him on trial, whatever. Have you ever seen the movie Bridge of Spies? No. Is this about that? Kind of. Because I was going to say, this is like an awesome movie. Yeah. So there's been, like, there was a movie made, I want to say, in 76 um, about this, specifically this mission with Gary Powers. Bridge of Spies uh, came out in 2015 it was with Tom Hanks. And that was around the negotiation um, where we had they had like a KGB colonel got arrested in Brooklyn for espionage and maybe somebody else. And then we had Gary Powers and they, they met basically they did this deal and they met in Berlin on this bridge where they did a prisoner exchange. And it was like a very it's a very good movie and a very intense situation. They go through all the, the negotiations and like mm-hmm. the spy agencies and stuff like that. And Gary Powers comes back. But like he he came back and was like not given like a hero's welcome, you know, like a, let's give this guy a purple heart and all these different. It was like no, like they brought him to a safe house and interrogated him for three weeks and then discharged him. Um, but that was that was the case. Uh, this you know this Alan Dulles, and it was really Alan Dulles was trying to subvert the president's wishes. Which that to me is like where, where the tinfoil came in, and it's like, how do you how do you have this situation, where your normal protocol is let's wipe this thing completely clean, the pilot will die, he'll hit, he'll hit the self destruct button, like yeah, a plane went down, it was a NASA plane, don't worry about it, but this time the plane goes down because there's also, um, Alan Dulles was like, well, there's no way it could have been shot down at that altitude, he must have been flying lower. So the MIGs intercepted him, and he's like, no, like I was not – Gary Powers would be like, no, like I was shot down by these these missiles. So there's like confusion about whether or not it was like a malfunction of the plane or that he got shot down. And in that congressional hearing, they're like, you openly are contradicting yourself. And Alan Dulles is just like – like basically like what are you going to do about it? Like – I, like I'm the guy who's really in charge here. Like I own the spy agencies, and and that's like goes back. Do you remember that Chuck Schumer comment about um, about the intelligence agencies? I think we've talked about it. Yeah. Before. So Trump was like saber rattling, you know, the intelligence community. Like these guys are bad guys. Whatever he was saying in the beginning of his term, or maybe it was right before he took office. And out and Chuck Schumer, who's like the senior member of the Senate. He goes, I would be very careful. The CIA intelligence community has six ways from Sunday to get back at you. And it was like, why the fuck are you saying that? But it's it's kind of, that's probably why it's always been the case. So like, yeah, you can, you have to investigate this as Congress. You're the, the you know, the Armed Forces Committee. You had a plane shot down in the middle of the, the peak of the Cold War. You have to answer for this. But then when he answers for it, and there's like transcripts of it, and he's just like... I don't have to really answer shit. And then no one would really press him on anything because they knew that they, that he could probably do some damage to them. Like there's, there's links between him and McCarthyism. So it's like, Hey, let's, let's spy it. Let's get J Edgar Hoover on these guys. Let's get Alan Dulles on this. And we'll make sure people do the things that we want them to do. Otherwise we'll ruin them. And that's been like a tactic of the CIA forever. And then it's like, it's everything is just sort of kind of linked from that. So those U-2 planes 
were untraceable and unhittable for a long time. A certain guy named Lee Harvey Oswald, who was at those YouTube CIA bases in Japan, that's where he was stationed, he defects, goes to Russia. Soon after he gets to Russia, there's thinking that he helped them be able to uh, figure out how to identify these planes and then be able to shoot them down. So they had like these different um, radar installations that previously couldn't trace these planes. And then after Lee Harvey Oswald was there, they were able to do it. They shot down Gary Powers. So then Oswald comes back to the United States because he was always apparent, supposedly maybe, well, not even that anymore. It's been declassified. He was a CIA asset. Lee Harvey, that came out like within the last five years, maybe in the last two years. That the finally it got declassified that Lee Harvey Oswald, yes, was a CIA you know asset employee, worked for the CIA. So like, did he help Gary? Was this like some long game to always keep Russia and the United States with their guns pointed and their nukes pointed at each other for financial gain for like a few people? Because every president that pursued peace in that era got whacked out. So and it all goes back to Alan Dulles, and this to me is like the like the most blatant provable point in history where it's like the president the elected official what he wants is not always what's going to happen and have you heard about have you seen that uh the military industrial complex speech by eisenhower it was his farewell address you know are you familiar with that so right before Kennedy, so, you know, he did his two terms. Kennedy was coming into office, and he gave this, the military-industrial complex speech. I'm trying to find the language of it here. Um, but it was basically like we have to protect ourselves um, against influences that are sought or unsought because there are elements where, like, we have to push against this, these people who do not want peace, and they're inside of our own government. So then Kennedy gets into power and they have these, they, they pitch a couple of ideas to go get, go invade Cuba. So they have Operation Northwoods, which we've talked about before. We're like, we're going to blow up a jetliner and blame it on Castro and have terrorism. And then we'll have, that'll give us precursors to go into Cuba. And Kennedy's like, no, <laughs> like we're not, we're not fucking doing that. We're not killing Americans to go in to have a war against Cuba to defeat communism of something that the, those people wanted. And then they did the Bay of Pigs where they like bullied him into the Bay of Pigs. And then they were like, they sent 2000 troops that were trained by the United States or Cuban exiles to land on the beach. And they they were convinced that once it actually started, Kennedy would give them air support. And Kennedy's like, I'm not giving you air support for this mission. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they'll be able to do it, and then people will come in from the jungles, and people will like ride, will join these exiles. There's a lot of people there who don't like Castro. Just never happened. So all these Cubans got slaughtered on the beach, and the CIA was furious with Kennedy for not providing air support, and Kennedy was furious at them because he was like, "You guys fucking lied to me about the nature of this mission and how how plausible it was." So then he he fires Alan Dulles, and so because he and Alan Dulles hated each other. And he started, he had a memo where he said that he was going to take the CIA, shatter it to a thousand pieces and scatter it to the wind because they were not uh, acting on the best interests of Americans. And he was also pulling advisors out of Vietnam at the same time. So there's a lot of people who are like, all right, well, we have Lee Harvey Oswald who's with this, you know, the U-2 plane. And then he's working for the CIA. He's in Dallas that day. Uh, and like that was all kind of retribution. And then they put Alan. So Alan Dulles is fired. OK, well, when the Kennedy assassination was going along, he went to like the, the secret. I don't know how secret it is, but there's this camp where they train spies and espionage right outside of, of their headquarters in Langley, where they, it's like he stayed there for three days. So even though he wasn't working for the CIA anymore, he had a base of operations at like the top CIA training camp to run everything while all that was going on so while kennedy was shot he was there while lee javier oswald was shot he was there when the body was brought back 
he was there. So it's like, well, what happened? You know, so it's all kind of linked. It all goes back to Alan Dulles. And then Alan Dulles got himself put on the Warren Commission and made sure that that came out the way that it was supposed to. So the CIA couldn't be implicated in um, in the Kennedy assassination. It's fucking, it's fucking crazy. It's really crazy. It's really crazy. And then, you know, so there's all these like benchmarks when they're supposed to release uh, and declassify documents. And every president has promised to do it. Clinton probably declassified the most. And then it got to Trump and Trump was like, yeah, like I'm going to declassify those documents, whatever. And then someone asked him about it somewhat recently. And he goes, if you knew what I knew, you wouldn't declassify him either. It was Trump's reply about why he didn't just declassify all the documents related to the Kennedy assassination. Because all the people involved with that are dead now. So it's like, what are you protecting? You're protecting this institution. And it's, it's like they are probably the most powerful people in the world because mm-hmm. they're the ones. And it's like, so now it's like I, they, it's reading this book. It's called The Devil's Chessboard. It is kind of, it's like, he's my boogeyman. And now it's like, I see it with the Ukraine stuff. I see it with, you know, it's like, you kind of just like, well, what's, what's actually going on here? Maybe you're looking for something that's not there. But to me, it's like, they all kind of have some similarities uh, involved. Where the head guy is just rarely the really, the real one in charge. Like yeah. Goodell ain't, Goodell ain't pulling all the strings. Who? Goodell. Like to use like a football term. Yeah, like he's got to have like he's got to have a team of lawyers yep. and people that are actually doing the and the owners everything. There's there's such a the the ball of yarn. Yep, is just so all the, the web we weave yes. when you practice to deceive and it's like you got to cover your tracks and like you know you got to have a fall guy and who knows who who it was for the Gary Powers thing, but Oswald Oswald himself when he was arrested was like I'm just a patsy like he was the fall guy. Yeah, and. So, but it all goes back. Every all roads kind of lead back to Alan Dulles, going all the way back to World War II. So, I guess my two questions are: Is did Eisenhower ever like publicly comment and be like, "Yo, this this guy fucked me"? I think that's kind of what the, um, the final statement was. Yeah, and maybe I'll see if I can pull up the the actual speech because. And also, like my second question is: He basically wanted power. This to happen to powers, no? It, it it sounds like he wanted to create – that would be beneficial to the CIA and, like, his clients from when he was at the uh, – I can't remember. It was, like, Sullivan and something was the name of the law firm. That it would be beneficial um, to his clients to, like, have the Cold War kind of, like, rage on. So – yeah, but that would rage on if he just died totally. If well, if he died totally, you could just it, that. I don't know if they wanted him to die, or they definitely they probably they probably wanted him to die. I figured he would die. The thing that's so weird is like if and I have the the Eisenhower warning here. I fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must gar- guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. So that security and liberty- So like that speech, if you're saying, did he ever say like, hey, this guy publicly fucked me? That speech is kind of like, hey, I got fucked. And then when Kennedy was president, there was an assassination attempt on uh charles de gaulle who was the leader of france at that time so he was like the general during world war ii of like the french resistance forces and then he was elected uh to be the the president or prime minister whatever they call it in france uh but head of head of their government there was an assassination attempt on him and they they had assassinated a guy they had stolen uh elections in greece they had had uh, ousted uh the leader of the shot the leader of iran who was elected 
democratically and they put in the Shah. That was all CIA. Like this is not like this is not tinfoil. Like this is proven true. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing in Guatemala, uh, Lumumba in Africa. They had all like the CIA was like actively assassinating leaders from around the world. And so there's an assassination attempt on Charles de Gaulle and Kennedy calls de Gaulle and was like, I got to tell you, like I had nothing to do with this attempt on your life. However, there are factions of my government that I do not control and I cannot speak to whether or not the United States was involved, but I can promise you like I did not order it. So even Kennedy was like, I like these guys in the CIA, like you just can't, so how the hell do any other countries trust us completely? I don't think they do. Yeah, I don't. There's no I, way they. Can. I don't think they do, unless you know. And and it's like they every country has, I shouldn't say every country, but like England has their own version of this, and Russia has their FSB. But but it it seems like no country, no country has our military. Like we spend more than any. Like the next not the out of the top ten, we spend like double what the next nine biggest military spend combined. And it's like, everyone's like, oh, China, China, China. China has two aircraft carriers and two base, two foreign military bases. We have like 98, okay? Like our, our war machine, our military around the world is so much stronger and bigger than everybody. And it's like, oh, Russia too, right? Like Russia is going to, Russia could, can't even beat Ukraine technically right now. So, it's like our military is the biggest, most expensive. It's, I think it's a third of our whole budget or maybe that might be high. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's like a staggering amount of cost, but it's, and, and we've seen, you know, congressmen and people like, um, who's that guy from South Carolina that I can't stand Republican guy. Um, he's whatever. I'm blanking on his name. He's run for president a couple of times, but he's like, yeah, well, it's like, we're not just giving this money to Ukraine. It actually, we give it to them and then they just buy stuff from our defense contractors here. So all that money is really just coming back here. It's like, well, no, it's fucking not <laughs> like you're, you're, there's a few people who benefit from building bombs where like, if you really just had that money, instead of just giving all this bombs and ammo and whatever to Ukraine, you could be, I don't know, fixing infrastructure, paying teachers more, like whatever, you would just have more money in your budget instead of just being like, let's just keep this thing going. And have bombs, you know, for bomb's sake, so we can, so our our defense military industrial complex can continue to make money. Because it's like, well, we spent damn near thirty years in the Middle East between Gulf War One, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Maybe you know, we'll just cause a war somewhere else because we've got the whole nation's got war fatigue and the jig is up. Sounds so, like a nightmare time to be president. I think it's always been a nightmare time, but I do think, I think you can make an argument as more stuff comes out that that is Kennedy assassination because Eisenhower didn't really take any policy measures to weaken the CIA. Kennedy was doing that. Like he was pulling everybody out of, um, out of Vietnam and he was trying to dismantle the CIA and he had like written a memo and it was like, all right, like the CIA is going to be, we're going to get rid of these different, you know, subgroups of the CIA and we're going to, you know, this is just going to be during peacetime. Like they're just going to be part, you know, of like the military, like, un, like, like it's just going to be a much smaller thing. It's not going to be its own organization. Like the military is going to be in charge of it. And they were never supposed to do any domestic espionage, which they do all the time. And, uh, and yeah, so it's always been a nightmare time, but it does, I think you make an argument that that Kennedy assassination might've just been a coup where it's like, Hey, like this is a power struggle and we're going to make sure that, we're the ones who are actually in charge. So the president thinks he's in charge and uh, fuck him. Well, we'll get rid of that guy. And then we'll have Johnson in there. And then, you know, uh, Tucker Carlson was on, this doesn't get talked enough, talked about enough. So Tucker Carlson was on Joe Rogan and it was like Gerald Ford became the president after Nixon. Well, they had set up, um, they got Nixon's original vice president, uh, Spiro Agnew on like tax evasion or something. So he had to resign. And then they, they told him the only person that will confirm to be your new vice president, because he wasn't elected at that point, was Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford was never really elected to anything. He was also on the Warren Commission. 
and there's documents that have been released now where they're trying to make the magic bullet theory kind of line up. And so, but it didn't work with the autopsy. So they had that one shot that kind of goes through his back, through his neck and zigzags all around and ends up in um, governor of Texas's leg. And with literally with the stroke of a pen, Gerald Ford goes, nah, I think that entry wound was actually up a little bit higher. So that's what the official report is. He, he just did it to make that Warren Commission, that magic bullet theory, f- physically possible. But it didn't line up with the actual autopsy of where that first bullet entered Kennedy's body. So And then so Gerald Ford played ball, and all of a sudden he's the president of the United States 10 years later, 12 years later. So it's all crazy dude. it is crazy and it's one of those things where it's like man i should just not think about this stuff because like what you can't do anything yeah, about it nothing. yeah but it is it's a i don't know it's bad and this gary powers thing it's like right we should have you know and they and they tried but it's like this is it's just too powerful of an entity yeah yeah i'm just looking at all this shit right now it's just it's freaking me out yeah it should. It should freak everybody out. But also, like, shouldn't because it is what it is. Live your life. But I hate that, though. Yeah. Yeah. You hate that. Yeah. All right, then. All right. Very interesting shit. Yep. This is this is fascinating. Shout out Gary Powers. Yeah. Sorry you got shot down. Yeah. Um, all right, then, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Uh, we'll be back on Monday with the draft. We'll see you then.